Today on Know the Truth from Philip DeCourcy. You see, our hope is not a wishing upon a star. Our hope is a standing in the mouth of the open grave of Jesus Christ and coming to the conclusion that He is risen, He is not here. And if Christ is risen, then we have living hope. Ours isn't a wishing upon a star. Our hope is anchored in an historical fact. So much of our fears and anxieties come not from what we're actually facing, but from our ideas about what might happen in the future. How much more courage we could have then if we knew the future was bright? Well, today on Know the Truth, Philip DeCourcy explains that as followers of Christ, we don't have to fear tomorrow. We may not know what each day will bring, but we know how it will all end. Teaching from 1 Peter chapter 1, here is Philip DeCourcy. Let's look at our text then. Now, there's three things about this hope or this idea that the future is looking good. Number one, the ground of this hope. Number two, the guarantee of this hope. Number three, the gladness of this hope. We have a living hope, verse three, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You see, the God who has given us new birth as a gift, right, has also given us new life through the new birth. And with that new life, we have been given a new hope. And this hope is endless. This hope is living. This hope doesn't fade. We who were once in this world without God and without hope are now made alive in Jesus Christ. And by the mercy of God and the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, we are now alive to Jesus Christ and we are now alive to the living hope that He gives to everyone who has put their faith in Him. Our hope is living and breathing. That's why if you are increasingly hopeless, you're getting away from the gospel. You're not preaching the gospel to yourself enough. You're allowing your emotions to dominate. You're allowing your circumstances to crowd in because it's an historical fact that Christ is risen. He's at the right hand of God. He's interceding for you. He's got mercy and grace for everything you need. He's coming back to take you to an inheritance that's reserved in heaven. If you preach that to yourself, out of the dumps you will come. You want to know the ground of this living hope? The empty tomb. So let me say this and move on. Don't load your hopes on the temporal shoulders of a situation, a person, a location. Rest your hope squarely on the shoulders of the everlasting risen Christ who left behind him an empty tomb. That's the ground of this hope. Secondly, the guarantee of this hope. The guarantee of this hope. This living hope is through the resurrection of Christ and it is directed toward and fixed upon a heavenly inheritance. Let's keep going. So we have a living hope, right? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ to, verse 4, an inheritance. So we have hope through Jesus. And now this hope is fixed upon an inheritance that's incorruptible, undefiled, doesn't fade away. It's reserved in heaven, kept by the power of God. Anne Graham Lutz, the daughter of Billy Graham, I've enjoyed some of her books over the years. In one of her books, God's Story, she tells about an incident at the beginning of a new school year. She'd just taken her children to school. She had met a girlfriend for lunch and she headed back to their home to discover that it had been broken into. That's never happened to me, but I believe it's happened to some of you. That's got to be a terrible, unsettling feeling to come at home and find that your sanctuary, your home has been violated. Someone had broken in, stolen some of the family's cameras and jewelry and silverware and so on and so forth. And the police arrived, stuff was looked into, and an investigation was started. And later on in the the day, she crawled into bed 
rather discouraged and disappointed. And, and the whole thought of being robbed kind of did something to her psyche and her head. And she started thinking, you know what? I've been robbed today. And there's other stuff that I can be robbed of. You know what? My health can be robbed by illness. And my house can be burned to the ground. And my education can become outdated. My children can leave the home. And my husband can drop dead. And my, my youth can be robbed by old age and my reputation by gossip. It's a lot of stuff can get robbed from you and me. Amen? But you know what? Here's something that will never be robbed. Our treasure in heaven where thieves can't break in and steal. This is an unfading hope. And so that night, lying in bed, think about all that. She got up the next morning, I believe, and she, she got a piece of paper and she wrote down the alphabet. And she started working through A to Z. Or as we say in Britain, A to Z, which you should be saying, but I've given up. A, accepted by God. B, beloved by God. C, chosen by God. D, delivered by God. E, enlightened by God. F, forgiven by God. G, graced by God. H, hope through God. I, inheritance in heaven. J, justification. K, knowledge of God. L, love. M, mercy. N, nearness to God. And on she went. By the way, she got to W with wisdom. I never find out if she got anything for X, Y, and Z. If you can come up with that, that would be a good one. But you get her point. She just went through an alphabet of things that can't be taken. And it brought a sense of peace and security. My friend, you and I have a hope that's grounded in the resurrection. And you and I have a hope that's guaranteed by a sovereign, powerful God. Let's get to the last thought. The gladness of this hope. The gladness of this hope. Now we're at verse 6, kind of through to verse 9. This is a living hope centered on the future that provides a present joy. Now, I chose those words very carefully. And if you've been tracking, I just summarized where we are in the sermon. This is a living hope centered on the future that provides a present joy. Look at verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice. Though now, for a little season, if need be, you have been grieved with various trials. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold, that perishes though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom, having not seen, you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing, notice again, you rejoice with joy inexpressible, full of glory. It's a joy tied into future glory that we will receive at the end of our faith the salvation of our souls. So I want to say again, we have a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ centered on a future glorious inheritance and that provides us a present joy. See, if you've got hope, you've got something to live for. If you've got hope, you've got something to find happiness in. And though the believers here were facing sorrowful times, the Christians to whom Peter writes possess a present joy independent of their circumstances, a present joy that comes from knowing their souls are safe, a present joy that knows that death has been conquered, a present joy that anticipates the end of their faith when they'll be glorified. Now, if you've got that present joy, based on that future hope, you're able to handle your trials. You're able to handle your trials because they're momentary. They're passing. And actually, if you and I handle them right, our faith is going to be refined and when Jesus comes, those of us who love him are going to have a big faith in him. We're going to have a growing relationship with him. And you know what? He's going to praise that and he's going to honor that. So let's delve into the trials just for a few moments as time is fleeting. By the way, the word various means many colored, polka dotted. It's all kinds of trials. Physical, spiritual, financial, relational. You get it. Let me say three or four things, and I mean quickly about these trials that are to be handled with present joy in the light of our future inheritance. Number one, their trials were passing. Did you notice that? Their trials were passing. In this you greatly rejoice, though nigh at this moment for a little while, things are rough. You're grieved, hurt, broken by a trial. But Peter says, I want you to notice that your trials are temporary and your trials are transient. Now, let me say this. Don't be reading into that. That that means when I face a trial in life, it's going to pass quickly. That's just not true. 
There are brothers and sisters right now who haven't seen the light of day in North Korea and other parts of the world. Their trial is ongoing. It is a long time. Maybe a lifetime. My daughter Beth and their team are ministering to beautiful kids and people in this church who God has graced with a trial of lifelong disability. Don't tell them it's just for a moment because it feels like a lifetime. So when Peter says this, he's not saying that your trials within life will be short. He's saying in the light of eternity, by that measure, they're short. The human experience can be very long, heartbreaking, where you almost want to give up every second day. But my friend, hold on. It's passing. But you say, Pastor, it's not passing. I've had to tell certain women or men coming out of a brokenness in marriage or whatever, hey, you might have to bear singleness for a, for a lifetime. And they can't imagine how they're going to do that. But I have to remind them it will pass. Not, not in this life necessarily, but in eternity it will pass. And at the three billion year mark, you'll forget about it. That's what's being taught to us here. That's why Spurgeon is dead on. I love what Spurgeon says. He says this, Often when I was traveling in the continent, I have been obliged to put up in a hotel that was full, where the room was so inconvenient, it was scarcely furnished with any accommodation at all. But we said to ourselves, Oh, never mind, we're off in the morning. What does it matter for one night? I'm telling you, I remember years and years ago, it's not in my notes, it just comes into my mind. I was a pastor of Placerita Baptist in Santa Clarita. And dear friends and ours, the girls were small. I was at the seminary. So I put some money together and we were going to go down to Disneyland for the day. And we were going to go down the night before so we could get in right on early, have some energy and have a blast. And we booked a hotel or this friend of mine who's no longer a friend since he booked this rotten hotel. <laughs> it was a rotten. I mean, the ba- I'm telling you, the sheets were dirty and smelly. I mean, it was wild. But you know what helped? It was the thought, okay, this is rotten. This is bad. You know, maybe we'll get, you know, typhus from this. But, but tomorrow we're going to be at Disneyland. Okay, girls, get the bed. You girls get in the bed. Mom and me will sleep on the couch. But the point is, we had something to look forward to that, that gave us a present joy, not because the present was joyful, but the anticipation of what lay ahead and, give us joy to push us through it. And that's Spurgeon's point. Hey, you know what? Whether it was Spurgeon in Europe or us a few miles from Disneyland in a stinking rotten hotel, hey, we're off in the morning. It's only for a night. Can't you handle that? Look at the trials, not only passing, but the trials are providential. I want you to notice a little phrase. It's actually interesting It's written in kind of conditional language. Look at verse 6. And in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you go through trials. If you read that, you might get the impression, well, maybe God will intend me not to go through trials. But actually, this is conditional language. But the way it's written in the Greek, it's assumed that you will. Okay? So bear that in mind quickly. This is conditional, but it actually assumes the reality. So you could kind of read it like this. You know, in the hope of this inheritance, you rejoice. Although now for a little while, by necessity, you're going to face trials. It's necessary that you face trials. Because he'll tell us in verse 7, because the trial will refine your faith. We'll get to that in a moment. But I want you to notice that that idea that the trial is not an accident, it's not haphazard, it's necessary, which would remind us it's providential. God has ordered it. Remember what Warren Wearsby said? For the Christian, there are no accidents, only appointments. In fact, in 1 Peter 4, 19, he'll talk about suffering according to the will of God. The false teachers that you find on TBN and other outlets tell us, you know what? God doesn't intend you to suffer. It's not His will that you be sick. It's not His will that you go through a trial. Oh, please shut up and go to seminary. Because that's not true. This is necessary. God has ordered it. And in His providence, He allows it. But it's no accident. It's an appointment. And grace will be appointed with it, by the way. But we've got trials that are passing, trials that are providential, and trials that are purifying. Trials that are purifying. Look at verse 7 that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at Jesus' return. 
So the trial is passing just for a moment, and it's providential because God has decided it's necessary, and it's purifying. Peter likens our faith to gold, and gold that's precious is gold that's been purified in fire. Peter's taken us to the workshop of a craftsman, maybe someone making jewelry and making something out of gold, and it's in the crucible, and it's being heated up, and it becomes molten gold. It's liquid gold. And the heat, the fire, brings the dross and the impurities to the top. And the the craftsman takes the ladle and scoops the dross and the impurities so that the gold being refined is much more precious. In fact, I'm told in, in some craftsman shops, they know that the refinement is finished when they can see their image or their face in the gold. It's a wonderful thought, isn't it? That's what God's doing to us. He's refining us until he sees the image of Jesus in us. But you get the point. It's a trial that's purifying us. It's maturing us. It's taking away the things in our lives that are getting in the way of the things that God wants to bring in terms of likeness to Jesus Christ. I like what Paul Tripp says again in in his book, Lost in the Middle. This is uncomfortable grace. I love that phrase. Anybody experiencing uncomfortable grace? Something that God in His grace has given you, but it's uncomfortable it's a trial he, he believes is necessary. So that you become more like the Lord Jesus and you long for heaven and, and you enter into an unabundant inheritance. I like comfortable grace, amen? I like health. I like stuff. I like good friends. I like happy family. I like comfortable grace. And you know what? God gives us a ton of it, amen? But he's going to give me some uncomfortable grace. He will you. And you've got to embrace it. Paul Tripp goes on to say this. Peter says that the trials that grieve us are the trials that God sends to grace us. The problem is that we're seeking the grace of release when God wants to give us the grace of refinement. Anybody praying for the grace of release? I understand that. Paul did. Can you take it away, Lord, this thorn? Nothing wrong. It's not evil to pray for that. But don't pray that too long if if there's not an immediate answer. Or pray along with it. Lord, maybe you want just to give me the grace of refinement. And then later on, you'll give me the grace of release. And he says, well, later on might be the rapture, but that's okay. Finally, the trials were profitable. The trials were profitable. Go on to verse 7. That the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it be tested by fire, notice these words, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's the rapture. That's the return of Jesus for His church. We looked at it in 1 Thessalonians 4. And when He comes back, if you and I are allowing the refining work of God to take place in our life, if we're persevering in faith until we receive the inheritance, we're going to be met with praise, honor, and glory. Now, some commentators believe that your life and my life will abound to the glory of Christ, and so it will. But the majority of commentators believe, and I believe with them, it's you who will be praised. It's you who will be honored. It's the martyrs, the saints of God, the faithful ones. They're going to be praised and honored and glorified. That's amazing. And I'll tell you what's amazing. It actually came to me in first service. wasn't again in my notes. You and I will spend our lives praising God happily. He deserves it. He's worthy of it. But this text tells me for a moment in time, God will stop to praise you and me for our faithfulness. Try and anticipate that. That'll keep you going. That'll help you fight sin. That will be a moment to cherish, a moment to embrace. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5, where every man will be found praised by God. A life of faith in Jesus Christ that proves genuine through suffering will meet with reward and blessing in the life to come. As the team comes up, I'll finish with this story. It's a good one. I stole it from a British leader, a Church of England man by the name of Calvin Reed, who tells about a meeting he had with a young man, I think a young man that started to come to his church, a young boy that had fallen when he was really young as a baby down a flight of stairs and just shattered his back. And he was in and out of the hospital for most of his life. In fact, when he was interviewed by Bishop Reed, 
He was 17 years of old, and he was asked how many years he spent in hospital. He told it up, and he said, I've been in hospital literally 13 of the 17. That's staggering. Talk about a trial that grieves. The pastor was so shocked. And given the demeanor of the kid, he was kind of, don't you, do you think that's fair? Implication, you got to have a problem with God. Or do you struggle with that? You know what the kid said? He says, no, because God has got all of eternity to make it up to me. Isn't that a good answer? God has got all of eternity to make it up to me. That's what Peter's saying to the suffering saints in modern day Turkey, back then around about North Asia, who were suffering and probably were going to face a worse storm that was beginning to filter out from Rome under Nero. But they could tread through the muck and the mire and they could keep going and persevering with a present joy in the light of a future hope centered upon the living Christ who was returning to them, for them, for life eternal. Folks, the future looks good. Father, we thank you for our time in the Word this morning. We thank you for this living hope. If it wasn't for the resurrection, if it wasn't for this reality, given what we do and the things we keep ourselves from and the, and the nonsense we put up with in a, in a wicked world, we would be of all men most miserable. We're to be pitied, stupid Christians. But, oh God, we have been born again unto a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ that's been attested and Peter's an eyewitness to the risen Savior. And because Jesus is alive, hope is living in the heart of those who are in union with him through faith. Oh God, you're good. We thank you you've mercyed us. Thank you you've regenerated us. Thank you you've justified us. Thank you you're sanctifying us. And someday you're going to glorify us. And we're going to enter into an inheritance reserved, waiting for us. Unimaginable. The eye hasn't seen, the ear hasn't heard, and the heart can't imagine. So it's a call to faithfulness. It's a call to sacrifice. It's a call to to present joy in the light of future hope. And if there's someone here or listening to this broadcast later on, we pray, oh God, if they're in the world without God and without hope, they will turn quickly to the Lord Jesus and find a hope and safety and salvation in an empty coffin. For we pray and ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Offering true and lasting hope from the book of 1 Peter. You're listening to Philip DeCourcy and This Is Know the Truth. Now, perhaps as you were listening today, you realize that you don't yet have that hope. You haven't submitted to Jesus Christ and you aren't sure where you stand with God. If that's the case, I encourage you to reach out today. We'd love to pray with you and connect you with more resources. Just call 888-644-8811 or go to ktt.org. And if it's your very first time getting in touch, we'll also send a booklet your way called Seven Days of Truth, Resting in God's Providence. It's a new resource by Philip DeCourcy, and it's our gift for any new listeners today. Again, visit ktt.org. And whether you're new to Know the Truth or a longtime listener, we're delighted you joined us today. We're so grateful for all of you who stand with us financially to make this program possible. As you've been strengthened and equipped through this program, will you link arms with us by donating? Your gifts are a blessing to your fellow listeners, ensuring that these messages can go far and wide, reaching a world that is hungry for the truth. And to show our gratitude for your support, we've selected an encouraging devotional-style book we'd like to send you called Pathways to Peace, Facing the Future with Faith. This book will guide you on a deep dive into Isaiah chapter 40, a passage that has encouraged believers down through the ages. You'll learn what it means to renew your strength as you wait on the Lord. Request a copy when you donate today by calling 888-644-8811 or go to ktt.org and look for the book titled Pathways to Peace. I'm Wayne Shepherd for Philip DeCourcy, inviting you to join us Wednesday as we continue our series called Be Encouraged right here on Know the Truth. Today's program was produced and sponsored by Know the Truth Incorporated. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free.